Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos, and I'll be your host. Celebrate to really do exactly what the title of the program says. We are going to celebrate the lives of Vermonters and some people from outside Vermont um, for all of you to benefit from. Um, one thing I've learned um, after, you know, over the years reading obituaries is that Gosh, many times I leave saying, I wish I had gotten to know this person. They had such a rich, vibrant life. And so this program is devoted to all of us that are still and enjoying life and doing great things in life, a chance to stop and celebrate people's lives as they move through their own. If perchance uh, in the future you'd like to be on this show, please write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com, and I'd be more than happy to put you on the schedule. Um, also, if you have questions for uh, one of our interviewees, please send me an email at the same address, and I'll be glad to forward that on, and I'm sure they would be more than happy to respond to you. So today I'm honored to um, have as our guest, Gwendolyn Evans. Hi, Gwendolyn. Hi, Gary. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm um, good. So Gwendolyn, and I just, for say, purposes of being uh, transparent, I've known Gwendolyn for a number of years. Um, love uh, getting to know her and be her friend and um, doing various things uh, in the community with her. Um, Gwendolyn is a deep spiritual thinker and guide for many people. She uh, loves her ethnic background and heritage, loves to travel. She's an advocate for those who are blind. Gwendolyn herself, um, amongst all these things, happens to be blind herself. Um, she's a wonderful <laughs> artist. And um, she's a determined, persistent person from what I've gotten to know her. <laughs> so Gwendolyn, let's start. That's so, another word, way of saying I'm very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that. <laughs> In a good way. Yes, I think You've so. You've made the world a better place for a lot of us. And oh, uh, we no. so much appreciate that. Thank you. So when I, you know, how did you become the woman that you are today, Gwendolyn? What foundational things in your life have happened to make you who you are? Hmm. Well, I, I guess I would say there's, you know, obviously there's a lot that goes on in one's childhood that forms or informs how you turn out. But it, a lot of times it can go one way or the other. Um, for me, I had a number of events in my childhood that were pretty tragic and traumatic, um, one of which being diagnosed with uh, glaucoma at four months old, uh, losing my mother to breast cancer when I was five, mm -hmm. and then consequently growing up with uh, around a family of fairly traumatized people who used and abused alcohol. And uh, so those are all things that I had to work with and work around as mm -hmm. I got older. Um, mm -hmm. I, I developed a faith of some sort. Uh, I was a very devout Catholic for a while, um, but really it, that faith sort of started before I became Catholic and has lasted well, <laughs> well beyond me leaving the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and it's a, a number of things growing up with a disability and then going out into the world uh, really <laughs> makes you have to think, are, am I going to, am I going to rise to the occasion and figure out who I am and what I want to be, or am I going to be uh, told what I to be and who I am? Mm. So I obviously did not choose to lay down and let somebody else tell me anything. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. So when that part of you that had to determine what am I, 
how am I going to handle this fate in life? Uh, lost your mom at an early age, mm -hmm. um, losing your sight at an early age, um, having not a very solid foundation of support even around you. I mean, these are, you're right, any one of these things is enough to throw someone totally off. Mm -hmm. um, and yet you persisted. Where did, where, where did that come from? Well, I do think it is. I think that our 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 laugh about stubbornness is <laughs> it's true. I mean, you, you you there is. I do believe that we have within us the spark uh, to uh, be ignited and, and to move into uh, the kind of being that we want to be in this life. Mm -hmm. um, I, and also for me, I mean, I, I don't, there are a lot of things that happened that have helped me evolve. And I kind of go, wow, wow. I really feel guided at times. I really feel mm -hmm. like there, there was a higher power working with me on my behalf. Um, and I did I think I just was wired and, and I gravitated towards people uh, mostly outside of my family who were supportive, who did cheer me on. And we need that. We absolutely need that. One of the most instrumental people early on was my maternal grandmother who mm. uh, made me feel safe, made me feel loved and welcome. And um, I, I just... I wish I could tell her now how much that meant to me and how it saved my sanity mm. to have that. Mm. Yep. Yep. So she was definitely an anchor in that. Uh, yes. That, yes, that, yes. You know, Carl Jung talks about the collective unconsciousness yes. that we are, uh, we are generations past uh, combined for us and then we move that forward. You have any sense of your family's history beyond your present oh, family? Oh yes, oh yes. Um, so my father was born in Wales, which is part of the UK, and I'm very connected to uh, that side of my family in terms of the energy there. I've been, I was able just about five or six years ago to connect with a cousin over there, two cousins actually. And their father was my father's first cousin. I've been to Wales several times. I really, I really think that knowing some of your past and where you came from, and if you have the opportunity to go to the area where you came from, it mm. does something for you. It really expands your mind. And I got very tuned into um, just how much it takes people to get up and leave their family and their country of origin and come to this country. Uh, my grandfather brought his wife and, and twin children over in the 20s, and he did that because the area in Wales that he was from was economically seriously depressed mm. and um and yet you know he came here and uh, the family continued so mm. and that was you know recent history my yeah. maternal side comes from the mayflower believe it or not oh my goodness <laughs> i know <laughs> And there's probably some, you know, some some history around that. And I, I think about what's going on in the world now and kind of what we started. Good things were started and then not so good things were started. And I'm just recently, you know, in the circumstances we're living in now, I, I have cause to reflect on um, where we as human beings have kind of come from and how we might have screwed up <laughs> how we might think about going forward differently um yeah. um yeah i mean i think that one thing is on both sides of my family came from people who felt oppressed or repressed in some way um probably were the, the welsh certainly were and um various and sundry religious people but then we come to a new country and we turn around and do exactly what was done to us 
Mm -hmm. So we have to wait. Yeah. yeah. So on the one hand, they they were courageous enough to say, "I'm out of here. I don't want to live my life being oppressed." Right. And yet, you take all that <clears throat> oppression with you into the new country. Yep. And and um, not much changes in a sense. Right. Turn around and and um, take the land and uh, kill the natives and uh, yeah. yeah yeah yeah. So one big part of your life is your spirituality and so the, and you have worked it so much in your life that you actually are a spiritual guide for others. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about that. Uh, um, you know, it's interesting. I, um, as I said, I followed, a, a sort of a traditional Catholic path for a while. Um, and then for a while I was agnostic. And then I really never, I, I don't think spirit has ever left my life. My awareness of it has changed. And my awareness of energy as it is, and I use energy as everything. Mm -hmm. Energy is in everything. It's in you know, solid objects, it's in every living being on this planet, and and there's more that connects us that divides us. And, um, you know, I, I think that I just am wired to share my experience and my strength and hope with people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I went to college, and I sort of had my Catholic background there, and I sort of <laughs> <laughs> left it there <laughs> um i kind of you know because i i evolved i ed got educated about all of these things i minored in religious studies but then i said oh there's there's a lot more of the world than this <laughs> you know so always exploring and at some point in my 30s um you know i kind of got involved with the unitarians which are a great group of people and another huge expansion in my awareness and I think that's when I began to see that I, I might have something to share for, with people. Um, I, I started doing workshops on, um, on the uses of adversity. And hmm. I don't want to say that I'm an expert in adversity because everybody has adversity, but you have to know that you can learn from it. And so that's where I started doing this. Um, and I just, I just continue to grow. That that's really important to me, both internally and externally. That we look into our our lives and we look in, inward, and really have a relationship with yourself. That's to me, that's critical. Um, from your relationship with yourself, all relationships in your life evolve. And I didn't get that when I was young. I wasn't taught that it's okay to love myself. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that through the, the various things that I was exploring in, in religion and spirituality, and also in therapy and work to get over my trauma. But that relationship with oneself is the crux of everything. Gwendolyn, mm -hmm. how... How has your loss of sight informed your life? How, how has it shaped who you are today? Well, let's see. Uh, there's different <laughs> different ways to answer that. Um, I certainly do not want to be defined as a, a person with a disability or a person who is blind, but I happen to be blind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, the, the general public would tend to label me as blind, disabled, um, and many other misconceptions, and that would be the defining terminology. Right. Um, I reject that, and I'm, I get very tired of uh, the response of not having... Uh, just a general uh, reception of being able to see a person for 
a person, not the disability or the appearance that they present, you know, Um, that, that, so that's a, that's a part that it it will, that issue in my life will never go away. Mm -hmm. I will always have to advocate for myself for something. And, um, and yet I also believe it's a, it's a rich experience to have this difference in my life to say, I'm kind of glad I can't see what's going on right now. I don't want to judge things based on what I'm seeing or not seeing. And I feel like the rest of the world does make a lot of judgments based on quote unquote visual appearance Mm -hmm. or objects. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixed bag, you know? Yeah. You know, I've met people from the outside would say has a profound disability. And in asking them if they had the opportunity to not have that disability, would they choose that? And almost every one of them says, I, I wouldn't trade my life for anything. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah. 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 And the terminology of uh, profound disability, well, anything in life can be profound. And yeah. it all depends on how the individual defines it not how the the person who's receiving the appearance finds it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you're also a a profound artist, I might say. And tell me about that part of your life, because that's that's been there for you for a long time as well. Yes. and, it, and that's been a profound part of my, my growth and my spiritual, my inner spiritual work, because both my parents were artists. Um, my mother was a very creative person. She was, she had been a painter. She cooked I mean, amazing things. She, she was an amazing knitter and crafter and did all kinds of things. And my father was a watercolor artist um and he professionally he was an architect so he was always drawing Um, but at in my childhood um it just uh, it just didn't appear to them or to anyone like art would ever be an option for me um you know there's all this stuff about uh, that they used to tell children about coloring inside the lines and you know, doing it this way and that way. And so it just wasn't a thing. And yet I do believe there's probably some genetics uh, mm-hmm. involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, spirit began to really move me. And I started um, having, I, I, I took, some workshops in body image and and things like that where I was introduced to working with polymer clay and that opened up a whole new avenue for me I was not expecting I have done a little bit of crafting never thought about that being a creative pursuit but when I started working in polymer clay um, it it bent my perception and and we need to bend our perceptions because there are a lot of people out there who say they don't have a creative bone in their body well all human beings need creativity and have creativity it is profoundly necessary to tap into that and to understand that the way that we perceive creativity has a lot to do with what we think we can do and what we think we can't do i never thought that I would pick up a paintbrush and yet mm. I, it just kind of, it wouldn't leave me alone. I mean, it, was one, <laughs> it was one thing to work with clay that, that made sense. And, and eventually, you know, people were giving me amazing feedback and I started having dreams about painting and, mm. uh, and I had friends at the time show up and say, Oh, you, you need to try this, you know? never in my childhood would I have heard that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Uh, so when I began I really understood that creativity was so much more than doing a good job quote unquote at what you're creating you know it, it is a process that 
allows us to find pieces of ourselves that we really like and enjoy and that help us open up to a deeper part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we don't have that in some level, I mean, it could be anything. Sometimes yeah. I'm um, working in clay. Sometimes I'm working in paint. Sometimes I'm writing. Sometimes I'm cooking. Yeah, right, exactly. It's, it's not about the stuff you choose to do. It's about the process that you want to engage in. How you approach the activity rather than the activity itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned writing. <clears throat> Tell me, uh, do you do writing? I, I do write, yes. I, I write every day. Um, I have a personal uh, practice that's very critical to me, um, which is I get up in the morning and I make my cup of Welsh brew tea. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> I've been drinking tea all my life. I make a cup of tea and I sit down with my little computer and I spend a good amount of time journaling. And that morphs into uh, prayer and meditation. And it might go back to journaling, but I spend at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half each day doing that. Oh, wow. <clears throat> That helps me connect inside myself, gets the inner dialogue going. Yeah. Yeah. And then <clears throat> you, I've done a lot of writing during COVID. Uh, uh, art, the art situation is has been really challenging and feeling, you know, like a lot of us, we're, we're all kind of turned upside down. Um, mm -hmm. So I really took <clears throat> the writing. Um, I began a Patreon page called Gwendolyn's Cauldron, and I'm really sharing it. I was, well, I was saying to your wife last night on the phone, I feel like it's my ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing <clears throat> my thoughts, my heart, my prayers, some of it with creativity, some of it with regard to art, but a lot of it is um, from my spiritual uh, background and, and what I'm seeing and feeling in, in the world right now. Mm. That's wonderful. So, yeah, so every day is a creative adventure for you in, in different forms. I try. So, yeah. 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 Some days are better than <clears throat> others, as you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, you have a gentleman named Yardley over there. I do. I and, do. And uh, you've so had sorry. various. Um, seeing eye dogs, I guess, for lack of a better term, over the years. What have those dogs meant for you? Uh, but yeah, Yardley is my third uh, dog, and it's from Guiding Eyes, which is in New York. Um, you know, I, I was going through a divorce when I got my first dog, who was a lovely, sweet um, yellow lab named Pilar. And she was kind of a spiritual guide for me um, mm. through a, a tough time. And she was with me for 11 years before she passed. Of course, it's always hard to see our loved ones pass, no matter what suit uh, they wear, whether they're four legs or two. Um, and then I had... Uh, another yellow lab named Parker, who yeah. I still think today he was my soulmate. Mm. Um, he was just an amazing creature and uh, he stayed with me uh, for a long time. And now I have this, this other being named Yardley and he's a wonderful companion. He's, uh, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a good guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, is it, it, having another presence in the house is very important. Um, having a guide dog, having that it's very well-trained uh, dog, it's, it's a wonderful experience. Yeah, I, I, I would think so. So um, are there things in life that you have yet to do that you would love to do? that are on your dance card? Yes, 
Of course. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell me about those. Oh things. my gosh. Well, there are still places that I'd like to travel to, you know, when we when we really are able to say it's okay to travel now. That, you know, I know people are traveling, but it just doesn't feel right feel like the right time to do that but there there are places there are places and and i'd like to see more um of this country you know mm -hmm. um, so i need i need traveling companions for that <laughs> um like to explore canada a little more um like to go back to europe um yeah so there's travel and i really would like to create a living space for the next phase of my life where I'm not beholden to um, associations or organizations and I can create, I, I jokingly say a commune, but what I'm looking for is I want to create a living situation with people that I love and who love me and, and we create a small community together. Mm -hmm. So... I'm looking at that as a sort of a project over the next several years. I mm, yep. <laughs> don't know where it'll go, but yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm always wanting to learn. Um, I'm always wanting to um, tend to my own inner growth and, um, and be of service, be, be of help to others based on the things that I've learned and, and that, things that i can share yeah. i continually work on that within myself when i think of um, that community that you want i i, I was thinking of co-housing um mm -hmm. where a group of people come together and share space and yeah. and uh, develop community something like that yeah i would on a smaller scale <laughs> right did you how did you get to vermont Oh, um, well, when I was a teenager, that was at the height of my full-on Catholicism. So when I started exploring colleges, I only looked at small Catholic colleges. And um, I remember I had a little bit of vision left. Um, I came from New Hampshire. Uh, we came up here to see several small Catholic colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, one was Trinity College in Burlington, which yeah. unfortunately has been gone for a couple decades now, but I was there um, and it was a really important experience. I, mm -hmm. I kind of fell in love with Vermont and it's a little interesting. Um, I remember the day we came up, I, as I said, I had still had a little vision. It was a day in November. It was a gray day. It was foggy. We came up Route 7 into Burlington. And here's this gorgeous uh, campus with brick buildings and ivy and it's foggy. It felt very sort of English Gothic-y sort of thing. Uh -huh. And it just <laughs> made me fall in love with it. And uh, and I really, uh, I really fell in love with the Burlington area. Mm. Haven't left. I'm glad you haven't. Yeah, me too. Me too. Oh. All right. Um, anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to talk about? Uh, I do a lot, as you said, I, I do a lot of deep thinking. Um, and since COVID started, I, I like many of us, kind of went through uh, a personal shutdown. And so many mm -hmm. things have changed and shifted. Relationships are changing. The way we do business is changing. People are changing all the time. And, um, and we can so easily slip into helplessness, right? Mm -hmm. and helplessness. And I really, the one thing that I reconnected with so strongly is, is prayer. Um, this prayer is, for me, a, a form of energy healing. I mean, I am an energy healer. I do, I'm certified in Reiki. I'm certified to do crystal healing and, you know, all these 
out there sort of things, which I continue to do, but not in the same way. Um, but I know that our thoughts and what comes out of our hearts and what comes out of our mouths and throats, it's all energy. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, um, yeah, I'm really relying on redirecting the sense of hopelessness and helplessness that I feel regularly, like many of us do. I'm trying to redirect it into um, the prayers, the energy work, the revisioning of what I'm seeing and experiencing and what I'm hearing on the news. Because I'm worried about our country. I'm worried about our world. Um, but I think the thing that I'm most worried about is how easy it is for us to stay in the negative thoughts and stay in <clears throat> just the negative perceptions of things and what's wrong. We can always t talk about what's wrong in the world. And we can always point fingers at who's doing this and who's doing that or what, what they're not doing. But that's not what we need to do, right? It's not what we need to do. We need to rework our thoughts, rework our feelings to uh, reframe how we are in the world. Mm -hmm. I really feel very strongly because um, that does, that's not going to show up in the news media. Yeah. That shows up in our relationship with ourselves and each other. And, you know, I hear about the violence that's going on in our world, the, the shootings and the uh, tragedies of kids with guns and all of that. And it's, yeah, it's really easy to go there. But I'm really determined to revision that in myself and be able to create a vision of hope in some way. Mm -hmm. I read, <laughs> I read a lot of fantasy books, and uh, people chuckle at me about this. But you know, we need imagination right now. We right. need imagination to <clears throat> create the world that we want to live in, instead of c accepting what is. I mean, come right. on, people. Right? Right. I mean, that is a crucial part, and that's why we need our creative forces within us to come up and take this on. You have such a, um, your insight into the human condition is, is very sharp and very deep. Um, have you ever thought about being a therapist, Gwendolyn? <laughs> no, I thought about it, but honestly, you know, it's, it's, I hesitate to say this, but I find huh. that line of work a little limiting. Hmm. How, how so? <laughs> Well, payment, first of all, you know, insurance, not insurance, do it, do it this way, do it that way, sign up with a practice, do your own practice. Oh, God, no, I'd rather be loose and free with what I do. Um, what I do isn't therapy. I, one of the best things that I've done for myself, and I think for my my work in the world is I began studying and uh, trying to practice nonviolent communication as uh, put forth by Dr. <clears throat> Rosenberg in his book, uh, Nonviolent Communication, A Language for Life. And it, it really, it bent my perception of my relationship with myself by getting me in touch with the language that I use for and my self-talk. Right. And that's what I try to help people with, is to bend their perceptions. Yep. I'm not a therapist. I'm an intuitive. I support people if they want to go to therapy and say, yeah, absolutely, because there's a lot I can't do for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and therapy has been helpful for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. But this being an intuitive guide... Um, I've just always been able to tune into people's energy and what's going on around them in combination with what they're saying. Yep. And I don't know where that came from. Um, I mean, I think one of my earliest memories about that uh, that's sort of connected in with it is um, I had a dream 
just just before my mother died. And mind you, I was only five years old, but I've never forgotten this dream. And in that dream, she came to me and was saying goodbye to me. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea what was going on. I just mm-hmm. knew mom was in the hospital. I've mm-hmm. always remembered that dream. Wow. I believe in that power. And, yes. you know, and I'm blessed that I've been able to help other people connect with loved ones who've gone yeah. on or connect with that sense of connection that's still there, but not in the physical world. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I have to yeah. take care of my relationship with myself so that I can keep clear and open and able to allow this work to happen. So I'm not in charge of it. I'm just a facilitator. Um, any, uh, I mean, you shared a lot of wisdom already. Do you have any other pieces of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience that have helped you in your life? We all need to play more. And I think the older we get, the harder that seems to be in terms of figuring out what is play. Um, mm. It can be very serious with ourselves, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm still working on that. And um, my play is very much connected to um, being with friends and loved ones, um, not just with art. Um, I've actually found it harder to play by myself just because of the sort of the enforced isolation of COVID. It's, right. it's harder. So, you know, we need to, oh God, we need to connect. We so need to turn towards each other and connect. Yeah. Stop judging each other. Yeah, yeah. Well, Gwendolyn, thank you for your time today, and thank you for who you are. You're an amazing person, and uh, it's it's an honor to spend this time with you like this. Thank you, Gary, and thank you for doing this show. It's just, um, it's a wonderful concept. It's a precious idea, and I, I hope that uh, I hope you'll continue. It's very thank magical. You. Well, give it a try for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you have a good day, and um, thank you all for watching, and special time with Gwendolyn Evans. Thank you. <laughs>